Hi, you've reached the high fashion hotline. Hi, my family's going to a picnic, but our clothes are stained. That's quite a pickle. Ketchup, actually. We want to look amazing. Go to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, right now, get up to 50% off all tees, all tanks, all shorts, and all dresses at Old Navy and Old Navy.com. All up to 50% off? Yes, get tees and tanks from $6 for adults, $5 for kids, and dresses start at $15 for women, $10 for girls. Hey, everyone, we're going to Old Navy. High fashion, Old Navy. Valid 621 to 627. Excludes clearance, jewelry, active, flat tees and tanks, licensed, and men's package tops. Blog Talk Radio. The year, 1888. The place, London's East End. Dead and mutilated bodies are popping up all over, from Stamford to Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper is leaving his mark, and the city's on edge. Yvonne Mason is back with a tale of murder and millinery. The Rhodes Hat Factory is booming while the body count rises. Why now? How are these hats connected? Has the Hatter gone mad? Mad Hatter, Yvonne Mason. Available now on Amazon.com. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Wednesday night, and this is Off the Chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. Of course, that was a piece of shameless promotion. That was my ad man, Chris Dunham, who does all of my ads for my books, doing an ad for my historical fiction set in Whitechapel in the year 1888 called The Mad Hatter. For those of you who know what happened in 1888 in Whitechapel, that's not what the story's about, even though it does run parallel with The Mad Hatter. And if you don't know what made hatters go mad, you must read the book because it is filled with why hatters went mad. I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, things just keep getting better and better and better on this show. Between the listeners and my guests, like my guest tonight, author Fran Ornstein, this show has just taken on its own train tracks and the train drives itself. I am so honored and pleased and humbled not even a year old yet, is doing as well as it is doing. Ladies and gentlemen, on Blog Talk by itself, we are up to 9,170 listeners. That's 9,170 listeners just on this show. We're a little shy of 830 listeners of reaching the 10,000 listener mark just on this show. We're well over 20,000 with all the podcasts we put up, and we're heard in over 65 countries. So my guests get the exposure they might not ordinarily get because of this show. And I've always said this show is not about me. It is about the wonderful guests that I have on this show. And just as an aside, get ready, because on December the 12th, put this in your books, on December the 12th, those of you who read the author James Swain, he is coming on the show, ladies and gentlemen. I am so tickled. So before we get into our our guest and and listen to some of Fran's poetry and see what she's been doing, this woman has been busy, 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 busy. I have to do a little housekeeping. We have two new sponsors to the show. We have author David, let me find him, um, Darren Cox, I'm sorry, author Darren Cox. And he says, don't let the enemy steal from you. A crown of thorns to a crown of righteousness by Darren Cox. Don't let any man, anything, or any situation in your life ever steal the things that God has ordained for you to have. One of the many great things of my generation that I see, one of the great things that breaks my heart, is I see a generation that has no idea of the destiny and the future and the hope that God has for our generation. I look at young people in hopelessness. There's so much. We have the cars, we have the entertainment, we have the lights, we have everything that the world could offer a generation, and yet there's never a generation more more depressed, more hopeless. Order today an e-book or paperback on Amazon or wherever books are sold, and it is called 
Don't let the enemy steal from you a crown of thorns to a crown of righteousness by author Darren Cox. And then we also want to welcome author Diane Moat. And she has this quirky little book for children that if I had a child at home, I would get tomorrow. And this is what she says. I have a great new children's adventure to tell you about. Pepper Neal. Pet Sits Magical Animals, and the first of the series, The Supernatural Pet Sitter, The Magic Thief, someone begins stealing the magic from Pepper's animal friends. She has to find the magic thief before the magic thief finds her. The Supernatural Pet Sitter by Diane Moat is now available on Amazon as an e-book or paperback. So plan ahead so you can entertain the kids on a long car trip Or, as we have been having in Florida, and Fran has been having in Georgia, and as they are now having in Alabama, Texas, and Louisiana, a rainy summer day. That's the Supernatural Pet Sitter by Diane Moat. Get it on Amazon today. And I just want to give a shout-out to our friends in Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, and the Panhandle of Florida. Our thoughts and prayers are with you during this Really, really bad tropical storm that is coming with tornadoes, ladies and gentlemen. So please add them to your prayer list or your good thoughts. Now, on to tonight's show. I'm so excited. I've been waiting on this for a minute. (laughs) Author, Author Fran Ornstein has been with me before, and the last time she was with me, she lived in Arizona. She has now moved to Georgia, and we are bringing her back. She is the founder of Sunwriter, a multifaceted writing project. She is an award-winning poet and writer. She wrote her first poem at age eight, submitted a short story to a magazine at 12 years old, and she continued to write professionally and academically and is the published author of fiction novels for children, tweens, teens, and adults, and she also has poetry for adults and teens. Fran gives workshops and hands-on presentations for adults and children on diverse writing, developing characters, writing for children, publishing, and free verse poetry. Dr. Ornstein has won awards for her poetry and short stories from the Florida Poetry Society, the American Association of University Women. She has been a member of a number of national and local organizations, including Sisters in Crime, National League of American Pen Women, the Florida and Arizona Poets Society, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, writing newsletters for several of these groups. Boyfriend, honey, you make me tired. Welcome. I'm tired listening to you. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me, my friend, what have you been up to besides moving clear across the country? Oh, for the 85th time, you mean? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I actually uh, have a book coming out soon. It's the fourth book in my kids' miss in my tween mystery series, the Shadow Boy Mysteries. And this book four is coming out as soon as we decide that uh, the cover is okay. I have a wonderful publisher who lets me let lets me see the covers. (laughs) Miracle of miracles. Yeah, that's true, because most publishers say, here's the cover, deal with it. I know. (laughs) Anyway, um, thank you. That was a very lovely introduction. Hi, everybody. This is Fran Orenstein. I'm really here. Yeah, you really are here. You are, in, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, she is closer to me than she has been. She moved from the beautiful state of Arizona to the beautiful state, my home state of Georgia, And since she's been there, I think she's gone from getting a driver's license for a car to getting a driver's license for a boat. Would that be a boat? No. Yeah, because of all (laughs) the flooding on the water. (laughs) (laughs) No, I was coming up because of all the rain and all the flooding. Oh, you mean a raft? Yes. No. No. Actually, the flooding yesterday was so bad up here um, because we're getting the remnants of, of every storm that comes through. Uh, mm-hmm. It was up to people's waist 
white lines in part of the perimeter around um, Georgia, around Atlanta. And cars, they showed pictures, cars, the water was up to their windows. It was really, really bad. So they oh, had to do a nice. lot of, yeah, they had to do a that, lot of uh, evacuations for people at work. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. Well, crazy. let's. Let's let's go back in time a little bit because people don't understand that that us as artists, this is not something that we just one day jump into. Like you wrote your poem at age eight. What made you write that poem? Why did you write it? And what did you learn from writing it? At age eight. I mean, that's a young age to be writing poetry. Well, I actually started writing prose at seven. I had them all. My mother, I didn't even know, had saved them. And when I moved, I went through every bin I had and found that she had saved it. I used to make these little books and staple them together, these tiny books with little stories in them. Um, I read Bambi, and I loved the book Bambi. I just, the story just was amazing to me. And I was inspired to write a poem about the book. Wow. Yes, and that's what I did. So um, don't ask me to get it out because I can't. The bin is, <laughs> the bin is not accessible at the moment. So let's put it that but, way. But, but the fact that reading Bambi and for those of you who have never read Bambi or seen the movie, it, it's a story about life. And for some of the younger generation, they might say, well, it's too cruel. No, it's not too cruel because it is about life. And for for Fran, for you to be that young and love the book, because it, it, it talks about life and death and hope and moving forward, to write a poem based on that just, it blows me away. Um. Yeah, I mean, the thing I love most in the world is reading. I mean, I've always, since I could read, I guess I was about four, four and a half or something like that. Um, I lived in the library. My mother was a reader, and so we went to the library at least three times a week. And, uh, you know, when I couldn't even pronounce words, you know, I tried to pick out the books by the uh, pictures. And uh, so uh, it was like a natural progression. My mother also was a storyteller. Um, I don't really remember her reading a lot of books to me. She used to tell me stories, so she would take take one of the fairy tales and she'd change it around completely, so it was a whole different story. And um, she loved she was a storyteller. So, so, I, I so guess you, I, never, you never got okay. bored with fairy tales because she changed them. Right, right, exactly. So um, so that was, I guess, my... my, um, my inspiration to to write and I just always loved writing I mean I as a kid and even as an adult I did I dabbled in all the arts you know painting and and music and and writing and just uh the writing just came very easy to me um so I set aside a lot of the the other things particularly the art and uh I still do music but um I loved writing and um uh, I just was so inspired. It was almost as though somebody, something was in my brain saying, oh, that's a great idea. Run with it, you know. <laughs> so I have, I have this, whole, um, this whole folder on my computer that uh, is just filled with ideas. I the understand book. that. I have, I have folders that have nothing in them but a title. Okay, yeah. And it, 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 the title hits you, and then you do a, a rough sketch, and then it sits there and ferments for however months mm-hmm. until you get back around to it. So, what what kind of short story at twelve years old did you write and then submit it to a magazine? I mean, this is just amazing to me. Well, this was this was very sad for me. It was an eye opener at the age of twelve. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, but it was a long time ago. I think there were still dinosaurs roaming the earth. Anyway, I um, 
I wrote a story about a little a girl. She was she was graduating from junior high school, and she they were too poor for her to get a dress for graduation. And I named the poem. And I named the story. I'm sorry, the white dress. And it was how she came to get a white dress to wear for graduation from junior high school. And I I liked it. I didn't even tell my 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 fa- my parents. I didn't tell anybody I was doing this. I sent it to McCall Magazine simply because my mother subscribed to it and it had all these short stories in them. And I didn't tell the uh, tell anybody in the le- in the cover letter that I was uh, twelve. <laughs> so I just sent it off. And I guess about uh, in March. And then I guess about two. A month or two later, I got a uh, letter in the mail thanking me and that, you know, the story, you know, was not going to run. So in June, the magazine appeared in the mail. I opened it up, and in it is a short story called The White Dress. It wasn't my – I hadn't written it, but it was the same story. Oh, no. Yes. I was devastated. Little did I know that this was an omen of things to come in the publishing world, I mean, of how mean and cruel it was. Um, But, of course, you know, I was 12 years old. What did I expect? Um, I guess I expected more. But I I, I think I was so devastated that they took my title and they took the storyline, and I guess they had somebody else write it. And, so and was, sadly, sadly, this also happens in this day and age. And, and we have to be very careful because there are less than honest people out there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to tell you the truth, except for Betsy McCall paper dolls, <laughs> I never looked at another McCall magazine ever again. And I don't blame you. Yeah, and and it's not only it's not only uh, literature that's done that way, but people do music that way as well, and art. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Music. My son is a musician, professional musician, and you know it, it's just a terrible, terrible um, field to be in. I mean, it's cutthroat. It is. People go for something. <laughs> you know, it's really bad, and um, but. Publishing isn't any better. I mean, the publishing world, you know, I have a whole presentation I do on this. I don't like Mm -hmm. to discourage writers, and I tell them, you know, but look elsewhere, too, to be published. It doesn't have to be with one of the big five in New York. That is the truth. Because the the big five, big six has been telling us what to read for over 200 years. And now Mm -hmm. I think they're getting a little bit scared because they can't tell us what to read anymore. Yep, because there's so many of us out there that are saying, "Here we are. We're offering an alternative reading," and the big six is. In fact, my husband and I were talking about this today. Some of the authors that he's loved for years, he says, "Yvonne, their writing has gotten horrible." He says, "There's oh, no I've doubt." Oh, I stopped reading a lot of those authors. I get, I'm so disappointed because yeah, it's well, so. He write, wrote now, or somebody's writing it for them. I don't know. Well, we know James Patterson has people writing for him, and a lot of, you know, I've gone to conferences where I've met authors who do the writing for some of these very famous authors. And what makes it so sad is is the big six is pushing these these traditional authors to put out books every three, four months to to keep them out there. And ladies and gentlemen, what happens is, the story has no depth, the characters have no dimension, and the the plot line is very, very weak at best. And it's it's sad because some of these authors have been around forever and wrote great books. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and I like character-driven books because there's just so many ways you can plot a plot. Yes. Uh, it, 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 it's not infinite, but there are. But people are so amazing. Um, you can you can just just write just so, so the character stands out. Mm-hmm. And what's happened with a lot of these um, books, 
and the authors is that their characters no longer can be developed. No, and and they become bland in the book. You could go from the first page to the last page and know exactly what happened without reading the middle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't. They don't draw the reader into the book anymore. And and you and I both know that if you can't put the reader inside of a story, then you've re- literally wasted that reader's time. Because mm-hmm. if they finish a book and they feel unfulfilled at, for not being able to be part of that story, that's sad. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And, but, and said, know, new Go ahead. <laughs> I said there were always new authors coming through, not necessarily authors with these the big five or six, but there are good authors out there, and I know a number of them. They're very yes. good authors. They there are good and and so ladies and gentlemen, this is what this show is offering you, is an alternative. If you're tired of reading, the same. If you can pick up five books from one traditionally published author, pick up five books, and you look at those five books nine times out of ten. And Fran, correct me if I'm wrong. Nine times out of ten, if you read the synopsis, the only thing that is going to be changed are the names and maybe the location. The plot line is going to be the same. The character uh, personality is going to be the same. The uh, location may or may not be, it, it may have a different name, but it will it will have the same atmosphere about it. And you could take that one book, read that one book, and know what the other four are about. Would that be a correct statement, Fran? Pretty much so now. But, no, I've been back reading authors that I really like, like their first books with a, with a particular character that they run 10, 20 books through, you know, over the, mm-hmm. on that. And the first book is usually the best book. The first exactly. Book is better than, than the current ones. It's, it's like they get bored with it. Yes. Yeah, and they're just so throwing something out there. Right. Something. Well, back to... uh... (laughs) So let's go back to indie authors, and Fran in particular, because the reason that we bring this up, things that y'all might not know about Fran is she was a teacher, a magazine editor writer, a counselor. She managed women and children's programs, including child care, violence provision, gender... I can't talk tonight. Equity... Equity, thank you, my tongue's tied, and disabilities, and was an officer with the New Jersey AmeriCorps. Fran presented workshops and papers at national and international conferences, wrote and managed grants, created, edited, and wrote numerous newsletters for government and community organizations, political speeches, promotional materials. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but she's got a bachelor's degree in early childhood education, a master's degree in counseling psychology, a doctorate degree in child and youth studies. And the reason I bring this up is the burning question, and I know the answer, but the audience may not. The burning question is, with all of this under your belt, has it helped you be able to write children, tweens, and teen books in a different perspective than someone who just sits down and writes a children's book who's never been into the psychic of a, of a child. Yes, as a matter of fact, all of my books have, well, particularly the, um, the tween books, they all have the main characters have an issue that they have to deal with. Um, in in the in Fat Girls from Outer Space, which is a standalone book about uh, about girls growing up, becoming you know adole- pre adolescents into adolescents, um, the the issue is body image, the issue is is bullying in school, the issue is new friendships and losing old friendships, dealing with your parents' divorce. There's so much going on in this book. And it's how the the main character and her new friends deal with these uh, some of these issues, 
and overcome it themselves. That's the whole trick of writing for children. They have to overcome whatever it is themselves. You can have adults there, and you can have adults in the background. Think of think of peanuts with the yep. <laughs> adult voice in the background. <laughs> That's the adult's voice. They don't have any real part in it. The kids solve everything themselves. So by doing this, you're you're bringing up an issue. You're having the kid deal with it and solve it in some way without a, any without parental dis, um, input and without preaching, because that's the big deal with with books for kids. Yes, never preach. They'll never read it. And and they but they have to be able to see the life even if it's fiction they have to be able to see how that character handled the things that were going on in their life and then translate it to their own life and be able to make conscious positive decisions. Yes, and and Freddie in Fat Girls is is fat. I mean, she could. You know, she could also be thin. She could also be have a have a disfigurement. She could have a lot of things issues. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that I I based it on my life, and I was an obese child, and so I made Freddie an obese child, and um, and how she deals with it, and her new friends that she meets, and how they are also obese children, because I I used I used two women that who I knew for this. Um, for this book, uh, and I interviewed them, and they are main characters in the book as kids. Um, but to just give you a, an idea, I have just two very fast poems that I wrote for the book. Oh, absolutely. First one's called Just a Piece of Glass. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is this creature round and small with mousy hair and greasy clumps, giant zits on raw red lumps? Teeth encased in shiny wire, you're so pretty. Liar, liar. Big butt, big thighs. Why me? Why, why? Help! The mirror doesn't answer me. It's just a piece of glass, you see. And the second poem is called Who Am I? I'm not what you see on the outside or want me to be to please you. I am who I am. I do what I do because I'm true to me. So look in me, not at me. You'll see me, the real me. This is the key that lets me be free to be me. That's who I am. Wow. Those are powerful poems, Fran. And and I'm I know that there are adults out there who know children or have children who feel that way and and don't yeah. feel like people see the inside they're too busy looking at the at the at the wrapping and that's all it is is wrapping we are not who we are from the outside in we're who we are from the inside out but i will get answers from parents and grandparents when they like at book fairs and things they see this book and they say well my child isn't fat or i don't want her to think she's fat so i bought the book that isn't the point it could be right. anything your child could be too thin and she's called thick, you know, or something like that. Or she has her hair that she hates. It's too frizzy or, or it's, too, too it's too thin or whatever it is. You know, there's a lot of, you know, you know, kids at that age, 12, 13, my God, they wake up in the morning and there's a zit on their chin and they die right there, you know. <laughs> Nobody will like me. Yes, yes. And they have to learn that. What you what what happens in junior high school? Getting through junior high school, being bullied if there's anything a, an issue with you. Um, friendships friendships go awry and new friendships pop up. And, and so, the, the, some of the people that become your friends stay your friends for years and until you grow old and whenever you die. Yes, absolutely. In fact, there may be a listener on here, I don't know, who I met in second grade. So I don't know if she's, I'm she's listening. She said she wanted to. 
be there. Well, I hope she is. I hope she is because it, the important thing, ladies and gentlemen, that Fran is trying to portray, and I, I hope I'm I'm putting this out there right, is that when we can teach our children to be secure, no matter what the wrapping looks like, and when they can have friends that are around them, whether it's one or two or three or four good friends that remain friends throughout their lifetime, no matter what, and they don't have talk every day. That is more important than being shallow or thinking that you're the cat's meow when you're not (laughs) and, and just love who you are, where you are. Would that be fair, Fran? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a very difficult thing to do because you can't, you know, it's you can't re-educate the entire world. So it's a matter of 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 you being able to overcome and withstand these things because you're really you're really not going to change other people. They are who they are. That's right. You can only change the way you think. You can't change the way they think. Exactly. And, and how you. And, and that's a very hard thing to do. I don't think anybody, I don't know who's ever done that, have actually accomplished it. Well, I used to fake it until I made it. And then one day I woke up and said, why am I faking it? I am who I am. They either take me or they don't. If they don't, guess what? It's their loss because I'm kind of kind of fun the way I am. You are. You are. I've known you a long time, and you are. <laughs> but I did the but same I'm- thing. With the mystery series, each of the main characters has has some kind of an issue. Willie is the smartest kid in town. He lives in a small town. He skips grades. He has no friends. He spends his day reading by himself in an abandoned old cellar. And then there's this mystery kid who comes along named Hubie, as in Ruby. And um, he knows things he shouldn't know. He can make things happen, and and everybody in throughout the books tries to guess what he is, and they think he's an alien from another planet. They think he's a ghost. They think they come up with all kinds of things. I never tell. I leave it to the reader, the kids who oh, read how, the book. How neat is that? That's mystery under third base. The second book is um, is about Alex who is a lonely boy. His brother, his older brother doesn't want anything to do with him. His mother works three jobs, and his father is missing in action in the Gulf somewhere, you know, in the desert mm-hmm. someplace. And he's a very lonely kid, and he takes up with the bad kids in town. And then Hubie comes along to help him. In The Mystery of the Stolen Painting, Danny has dyslexia. The kids laugh at him. He stammers. He has trouble reading out loud. The words just dance on the page or turn backwards to him. And uh, he has his father was a police detective who tried who died stopping a robbery at an art gallery. But Danny has an amazing talent in art. He's an amazing artist at the age of twelve, and his art teacher takes takes him under his wing and gives him lessons. But is his art teacher really who he is? Or did he have something to do with this robbery at the gallery where Danny's father died? Interesting. And then the third, the fourth book is about twins, fraternal twins, Ellen and, and uh, what's our brother's name? <laughs> I write so many books, I forget everybody's name. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> They're twins. Um, they're twins, and um, they live in poverty. So their issue is abject poverty, where they don't have enough food to eat, they don't have a working toilet, they don't have any hot water, and they have to keep moving around because people make up things about their family. Their their, their father isn't there for them, and so and and I do this because. I think that it's important to emphasize the role of the importance of the role of a father in a family. That is absent too much in family, and that that is a sad state of affairs. And we lose 
our future, the father is not there because a family unit requires two parents. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you, two parents. I mean, kids grow up without one or another parent, but it's always there. It's it's a stigma, and you know when you have friends, and and as I point out in this book, he's he doesn't he has nobody to take him to games. He has nobody to root for him, so he plays no 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 athletics. You know, there's a lot of things missing in his life that he doesn't have, and so. Um, just just the um just for all of it for example in the mystery of the green goblin the uh, very first line is by november 1st the whole town believed that alexander cooper age 11 had murdered the worm on mischief night wow <laughs> so that kind of grabs you yeah it does now you gonna- all You also have written poetry books for women. Now, now ladies, pay particular attention to this because I have not personally read these books, but what I have read about these two books, I think we could all as women relate to the poetry in these books and to learn from them. So if you've got a couple of those, Fran, I would love to hear them. Yeah, I do. The first book is called First Footprints, and it's really a memoir in poetry. Very, it's very, people will relate to it. It's very relatable. Um, And I I was, grew up in Brooklyn and the Bronx, so a lot of these poems have to do with that, with with that area, with the New York area. Um, But, but, Everybody can relate to this no matter where they grew up. It's called Saturday Afternoon Movies in the Catskills. And the Catskills are mountains in lower New York State, right outside of New York City. It's Saturday, and it's raining. Glistening drops plopping on the roof. Soggy grass under black rubber boots. Squishing as we plod to the big wooden porch. Not a fun kid's day. Nothing to do day. Boring day. Another game of cards? Mothers save the day. We go into town to the movies. Daddies will drive all the kids, pick us up again. Movies in the 1940s, a special feature movie, another not-so-special feature movie, a newsreel, and a cartoon. The smell of wet clothes, the scent of popcorn and melting chocolate, fizzy cherry coats going up our noses, giggling, pushing, punching, and fluffing and shushing, 25 cents well spent to keep us happy on a rainy Saturday afternoon in the Catskill Mountains. I, I could see it. I could see that entire poem like a movie. Mm-hmm. And um, high, high school, 1955, geography of New York City, five boroughs surrounded by water, Rambling rivers, flowing narrows, the mighty Atlantic, high schools with swimming pools. Proclamation of nitwits. In the event of an atomic bomb attack, you must learn to swim. Swim where? Across the Atlantic to Europe? No, to New Jersey across the Hudson River. Either Miss Swim Teacher Extraordinaire, enter Miss Swim teacher extraordinaire, 100 years old, if it clothed in a long black swim dress, white hair tightly bunned, wrinkles stretched across pale, bony features, moving in slow motion. She gestures to the wall, voice quivering. Where hangs a 12-foot pole with a hook? Nothing to fear, I will save you with that. Imagination runs amok. Miss ancient swim teacher running alongside the pool with a 12-foot hook. Enter stage left, girl afraid of water, eyeing the hook and the ancient mariner. Uninspiring thoughts of incipient death by drowning. Lined up, several, seven fearful neophytes stare helplessly at the water. Oh, God, it's the deep end. Two seniors tread water prepared for rescue. Jump, Miss Aaron, ancient mariner yells. One by one, they hesitate and jump in and paddle. Seniors trailing at the ready until girl, afraid of water, stands at the brink. 
Jump, Ancient Mariner shouts. Girl stands frozen. Coward, yellow streak down your back, she shrieks. Is this me, girl wonders? Will this determine life's path? Will my decision today mar tomorrow? Girl speculates on a life of shame. Girl contemplates a yellow spine. Here's the snickering girls on the bench, the angry panting of Miss Ancient Mariner. Girl turns and walks from the pool. Bombs be damned. I love it because I'm afraid of water. That would have been me. Mm-hmm. I would have failed P.E. because I would not have gotten in that pool. Well, I had to get a doctor's note saying I couldn't go into <laughs> anything. <laughs> That water in it. <laughs> me, water and I have this relationship. If I don't go in it, it won't drown me. <laughs> okay, okay. It's logical to me. Now, you also have a series called The Shadow Boy Mysteries, right? That's the one I was I was telling you about. That's the one I was just talking about before. Uh, okay. The, the, there's a fourth book that you've got coming out on that one, right? Yes. Um, Tell us a little bit about that one. It's called The Mystery in Graham's Attic, and it's about twins who are live in abject poverty. I told I I mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I can read a little bit from it if you wish. I mean, that I would be the, yeah, that would be lovely. Okay, chapter one: Snoots and Rotten Apples. The hot Arizona sun beat down on Ellen Barron, roasting her like a turkey in the oven, except they didn't have an oven or a turkey. She sat alone on the grass, her back against the stone wall surrounding the middle school yard. Ellen tried to shrivel into the stone, hoping for some coolness and maybe disappear into the wall. She felt a tickle on the back of her neck and slapped at whatever flying critter wanted to bite. Ellen looked at her hand, but it was clean. She shook her head, but the tickle kept on tickling, so she pushed her hair aside and scratched. Finally, she gave up and figured a mosquito had already bitten her and flown away. Bloodsucker. And then I'm going to skip to the snoots. So hold on, so you'll know what the snoots are. Interesting. Okay. Then she, she, she looked off into the distance and watched girls practice flips for the tryout for next year's cheerleader squad. A few brave members of the squad of the marching band tootled on their wind instruments under the shady overhang of the building. Ellen saw Kinsey Taylor tilt the saxophone so it glinted off the sun. It should have been her saxophone, but they couldn't afford to rent it, so Kinsey played it instead. Ellen wiped away the tear that dripped over her eyelid. She hated Kinsey for that, but it was wrong because it wasn't Kinsey's fault that her father could pay for it. Ellen hadn't seen her father in five years because just after their second, seventh birthday, he went away and didn't come back. She and Troy didn't know why, so there wasn't anyone to blame. She pushed down the anger and squashed it under her toe until she didn't feel it anymore. Then she heard the low voices and giggles just loud enough for her to hear. She refused to turn toward the sound because she heard her name and knew it was the Snoots. That was the name she gave them, Snoots, the snobby, rich, mean girls, the pretty ones on the cheerleading squad, prancing around in their red and white short skirts, giggling at the boys on the football team, Maris, Jennifer, Zoe, and Cindy, the girl she wished would disappear forever. Did you see her hair? I don't think she ever washes it, Cindy said. Maris nodded. Probably smells like wet dog. Zoe shrugged. It doesn't matter because nobody would get close enough to smell it. Did you see that shirt she's wearing? Looks like she pulled it right out of the dirty laundry. Ella, Jennifer rolled her eyes. Probably doesn't have a washing machine, Maris said. Maybe she washes it in the toilet, Zoe giggled. I don't think they even have a toilet. I heard they use a latrine, whatever that is, Jennifer said. It's like a hole in the ground with a toilet seat, so we explained. Ugh, I might just throw up my lunch, Cindy said. Use the lunch bag and get off the blanket, Maris said. They all laughed. Zoe said, I heard my mother tell Mrs. Pickle that she saw Ellen's mother walking like she was going to fall over, like she couldn't walk in a straight line. 
maybe she's a lush, whatever that is, Zoe said. I think it's somebody who drinks a lot, Cindy said. Oh, you mean like that dirty old man with the paper bag who sleeps in the alley beside the liquor store, Zoe asked. Cindy nodded and then looked around and whispered, I think her father's a murderer or something. I heard my mom talking on the phone. What? Maris shrieked. Quiet, Maris, Jennifer said. Ellen's sitting right over there. Maris clapped her hand over her mouth. Then she whispered, my father's on the school board. He'll freak if he finds out there are murderous kids in the school. Well, don't tell him. My mom says they have had to move a lot of times because somebody always finds out. I feel kind of sorry for them. Come on, Jennifer, you never feel sorry for anybody. There was no breeze, but the tree shook slightly and leaves fell down on the blanket. Jennifer absently brushed them off her lap. I know, Cindy, it's like I'm suddenly being really stupid. Ellen started to jump up and scream, You're all liars. Your mother's a liar. It's all lies. But something pressed her shoulder and held her down. She brushed at her shoulder as if she could get rid of whatever it was, but it didn't help. She looked around and didn't see anything. Still, the pressure kept up, and now she was scared. Then in a twinkle, Ellen felt relaxed, felt safe. She knew yelling at the snoots was hopeless. People believed what they heard. Her mom didn't drink. She had one leg that hadn't worked right since she was born from a thing called cerebral palsy. Troy looked it up in the library. It was something that could happen at birth, like an accident maybe. It made her walk funny, like she lurched and dragged her leg. Wow. And and that is so poignant because this is exactly what happens. And sad to say, friend, children learn their behavior sometimes, most times, from their parents. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, really, who else are they going to learn it from except their parents and other kids? Learn exactly. It from their and it keeps going. And and the the thing is, the the opposite of that could have been the parents could have and should have been sympathetic and taught their children to be sympathetic and found out what was going on in that child's life. Well, yes, but everybody's so caught up in their own world. True. People very don't true. Reach, they don't reach out to other people. And, and, it's a very isolationist world that kids grow up in in many respects. And sometimes it's someone you least expect who will help them. I mean, in certain and, communities, grandmothers take over. Mm-hmm. In other communities, it's always somebody in a school, maybe a, maybe a teacher or a guidance counselor or somebody. And and what is what makes it even more sad is that child is as much as part of our future as the the high achievers and the well to doers and the ones that allegedly have everything and uh-huh. and when we negate that one child we tear a piece of thread out of the tapestry and we can't get it back uh-huh. yes your books are amazing you they just they reach into the heart and soul of the human conflict and Peel the, la- the the onion layers away to what you have left is the inner core of a human being and what their character is really like. Thank you. I appreciate that. Because when you asked me earlier what all this education had to do with anything, this is what it has to do with. You know, I'm, I'm kind of rather, you know, I'm retired. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going out work at this point in my life. <laughs> but I, I figure that if I can say, if I can change one life because a kid is reading a book that that rela- that resonates with him or her and then they can see a way out, I've succeeded. Absolutely. Because there's more than one way to teach a child. It doesn't have to be in a classroom. It doesn't have to be in a in a counselor's chair. It can be in a in a 
purely fiction book that is read for entertainment, Mm -hmm. but yet teaches that child, A, circumstances are not always their fault, and B, there is always a solution to every problem. Yes, and and what's scary is there are so many kids committing suicide now who don't see the solution. True. That is very true. And and again, when we lose one child, we mm-hmm. lose a piece of our future we can never ever get back. That's right. So your your books, Fran, they they are a breath of fresh air and they are needed in our society to save a child's life. Even if it's just one child, that's one child that we will have for tomorrow. But they're also funny. See, there's a lot of humor in the books. I just I just uh, hit on the serious pieces that are subtly serious. But the books are funny. I mean, they really are. You know, um, so there's well, a lot of, of Some of the best is, life lessons are taught with humor. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, so ladies and gentlemen, go. No, y'all cannot go now. You can't. You have to wait until after the show. After the show, go look up Fran Orenstein, O R E N S T E I N, on Amazon, and get these books for your children. Please get them for your children and get them for yourselves, because you can learn from Fran's teen, tweens, and children's books because it might give you a different perspective about your own child. Would that be fair, Fran? Absolutely, sure. And and it's a lot of fun. I have two um, historical romance adventure novels that take – one takes place in France and Konigsberg in, seven, in 1700, and the other one takes place in Lithuania in, uh, in 1900. And and adults love them. They really were meant for middle teens, but adults love them. What are the and, name of uh, those books? The Calling of the Flute and The Spice Trader's Daughter. And real quick, tell us about those two books. Okay. The, the Spice Trader's Daughter is the story of the Huguenots in France who were persecuted by Louis XIV and driven out of France. And one of the places that was willing to take them in was Konigsberg, which belonged to Prussia at the time. Now it is part of Russia, but it did belong to Prussia. And um, it's about religious persecution, royal splendor, intrigue, love. Um, It starts in 1685 when 16-year-old Claude, uh, John Claude, and his brothers escaped from France, sailing to Prussia. And on the voyage, Jean-Claude falls in love with Marie, who's in a family that's also fleeing France. And they have a daughter, Katie, and a few more children. And at 13, because Katie is also fluent in French, and these are the things that happen to these people in this time frame, she's sent to be the companion of a spoiled aristocratic Charlotte, daughter of of um, Prussian nobility. And because she's going to teach her French so she can marry into French nobility. And um, Katie has, uh, Charlotte has a a brother who is a a real rogue. (laughs) And uh, he's always after Katie and she has to get away from him. And he's very dangerous because don't forget, she's not nobility. She has, you know, she's on her own. She's only 13 years old and she's on her own. And, um, and her father always talked so negatively about King Louis the Fourteenth, and and he didn't. He always warned her, you know. And she was afraid to go to France, and she was terrified. And then then she meets the blacksmith's apprentice and falls in love. And uh, there's a lot of uh, there's intrigue. There's a lot. She does meet the king by accident um, at Versailles, where they go to have the wedding, and. Um, where Charlotte goes to have her wedding. And, uh, and then it's how they have to, uh, she and her, her uh, Katie and, and Guy have to uh, flee. They flee across the French countryside and 
they get on a Dutch ship headed to New York. And New Rochelle, New York, which is north of New York City in Westchester County, was a haven for the Huguenots. That's where the other place that they would free, flee. Wow. Um, yeah, and that's why it's got a French name, a New Rochelle. Um, so we, believe it or not, Fran, are mm-hmm. going to run out of time. I know. I wasn't watching the clock. <laughs> So tell the folks, and you know you're going to have to come back. Now that you're settled in Georgia, you got to come back. So tell oh. the folks where you tell the folks where you can be found. I'm at www.franorenstein. F R A N O R E N S T E I N, and that's my website. I have a lot of things, everything about every book. I'm also on a number of online. Um, online uh, book sales like Amazon and Book, um, Barnes and Noble, and other places. And uh, my publishers are the children's books are primarily published by Suaro Books in Arizona. S A G U A R O. Um, the my other my adult books are published by World Castle Publishing, and my poetry books are. The adult poetry books are published by Aquitaine uh, Publishing in also in Arizona. So, um, and they are they are good publishing. You know, they're 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 not the big five or six, but <laughs> they're good. And I am not a technical person, so I can't do it myself. <laughs> so, so ladies, so ladies and gentlemen, go and get her books. And, Fran, don't hang up when the show goes dark. Tomorrow night we have on the show, unless they lose power, author Stephanie Osborne and author Dan Hollyfield. Remember that storm is coming through, so hopefully Stephanie won't lose power. She lives in lower Alabama. Hopefully she won't lose power. And then on Friday night we have author K.J. Howe, and on Saturday night, author Kathy Weinfield. So join us at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time to learn about these authors and see what they have to say. And as you know, ladies and gentlemen, I always say this at the end of every show. If you want to be successful, stop asking permission. And you don't, <laughs> don't just feel special. Be special. And your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. How you leave others feeling after having an experience with you, you know, ladies and gentlemen, that does become your trademark. I say it over and over and over again, and pretty soon y'all will believe me because Fran has known me a long, long time, and Fran knows that how I leave others feeling, that is indeed my trademark. And Fran, thank you so much, my darling, for spending an hour with me and yes i'm bringing you back it will probably be january but i'm bringing you back because i love hearing what you're doing and hearing your poetry thank you yvonne i appreciate that very much and i enjoyed being on your show you're a wonderful host as i told you the last time well you make it easy okay (laughs) (laughs) You make it so easy because you're so interesting and your books are just, if anybody, people, go and get her books. I'm telling you, just go, just go get her books and read them. So remember tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, author Stephanie Osborne and author and musician Dan Hollyfield. Thursday night, author... Um. K.J. Howe, Friday night, author Kathy Weinfield. And ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to pass this show along. And if you want to come on the show, get in contact with me at offthechainradio at yahoo.com. And understand that we're all dreamers. Fran and I did not get where we are by saying I have a dream and then putting it in a corner somewhere. We made our dreams happen. And it has not always been an easy boat ride. 
it gets really turbulent, but we don't stop because when <laughs> we stop, we fail. Right, Fran? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've been through it. <laughs> yes, we have. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Join us again tomorrow night. I am your host, Yvonne Mason, with my wonderful guest and friend. I have known her for many, many years. She was part of, of the beginning of my journey. I will see you tomorrow night on Off the Chain at 8 o'clock with Stephanie and Dan. Until then, I say good evening. Good night, people. Thank you for coming. So, Fran, my darling, we are now off the air, and I wanted to let you know, as soon as I get off the phone with you, I'll get this up in archives and put it on the on the page and then tag you in it. And then tomorrow morning, I'll put all the podcast up and tag you in it so that you can put this on your website, pass it over to everybody you know or don't know or okay. people in strange places and <laughs> And use this to promote your books and, and the wonderful person that you are. Ma'am, I'm learning. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> now, when, you can, when you're talking to somebody and you really want to insult them, remember, okay. yes. bless I know. your heart. <laughs> I know. I just sent that to a friend of mine across the country, and I said, there's two things you have to learn. Yes, ma'am. Bless your heart, which means fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> now, but it's in the context of a conversation. We're off the air. <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be heard in archives, but that's okay. It's the context oh, of the no, conversation. No, no, no. Oh, my God, no. Why but don't worry you... about it. People will laugh, honey, because uh, trust me, I they hope. will laugh. They will, because oh. that's exactly what it means if if you're really oh. pissed off at yeah, but okay. if, if if it can also mean that you're in sympathy and empathy with them if it's in the context of the conversation. So, yeah, that is the, the – because Southern women were not allowed to be crude, rude, ill-mannered, and sociably unacceptable, so we found a way around it. Bless their hearts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've known Southern women, and it's really – it's really steel magnolias, that's for sure. That is true. Yeah, that's what they're thinking. That's the problem. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we we don't tell everything we feel. So, my darling, I will I will close this show and once again thank you and I will get with you about coming on maybe in January. And okay. by then you should have some more good stuff ready for us, right? I hope so. Yes. It takes so long for things to get published now, even with a publisher. So, That's anyway. true, but, but we can you talk have any, about it. the uh, new poetry, the poetry book. Let me know. I'm not I will. Uh, enough to get it on myself, you know. Otherwise, I'd publish it myself. But um, so, if you have any uh, well, ideas, let me know. we will we will put it out there in the atmosphere. And ladies and gentlemen, if you know of anyone that publishes poetry contact Fran because this adult poetry needs, I mean, this children's poetry book needs to be gotten out there. I really believe in it. Good night, my darling. I I, I apologize for my language. (laughs) (laughs) It's all in fun. Nobody took it serious. Don't worry about it. I've heard worse, believe me. (laughs) I'm sure others have too. Bless your heart, my dear. (laughs) And I mean the right way, not that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Same to you, sweetheart, and I will be talking to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Hi, you've reached the High Fashion Hotline. Hi, my family's going to a picnic, but our clothes are stained. That's quite a pickle. Ketchup, actually. We want to look amazing. Go to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, right now, get up to 50% off all tees, all tanks, all shorts, and all dresses at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. All up to 50% off? Yes, get tees and tanks from $6 for adults, $5 for kids, and dresses start at $15 for women, $10 for girls. Hey, everyone, we're going to Old Navy. High Fashion, Old Navy. Valid 621 to 627. Excludes clearance, jewelry, active, flat tees and tanks, licensed, and men's package tops.